Welcome to episode 62 of the MMA Rundown Podcast. We just had UFC Apex 2 happen in Las Vegas. The main event was Cynthia Calvillo versus Jessica I, so I'll recap that main event. Talk about the rest of the card, just go through it fight by fight. I'll preview the upcoming card, which I guess will be called UFC Apex 3. Also UFC Fight Night, Blades versus Volkov, so I'll run through that entire card as well and preview that. Talk about the UFC Fight Island announcement that just came through, both for UFC 251 and then also a few other cards that they had announced. Talk about some other fights that have been announced, and then the last thing to talk about will be a uh, fighter pay thing that came up again, because it seems like that just keeps coming up every week right now. Um, there was an interview that Dana White did on first take where Dominic Foxworth, who had worked with the NFLPA or NFL Players Association, was grilling Dana, and then also Nate Diaz was giving Gilbert Burns and Kamaru Usman a hard time for taking what they did for their main event on Fight Island. So from the top, we'll start with the main event of UFC Apex 2. That was Cynthia Calvillo versus Jessica I. Uh, just not, not a great fight. But it's not that anyone really expected a great fight out of it, so we kind of got what we expected with that. Uh, it's kind of unfortunate that I had to go a full 25 minutes and we had to endure that, but that's what it was. Uh, for Jessica, i not entirely clear what her game plan was. I know she was throwing a lot of the three same punches where it was the jab. Oftentimes she would lead with the jab uh, and sort of try to draw Calvillo in to, in, into her cross. Uh, and then sometimes if the cross wasn't there, she might just go for the overhand because Calvillo was keeping her lead hand down. Uh, I was fairly effective early on, at least, with landing the jab. Uh, had a little bit more trouble landing the cross. Uh, a few times she was able to land the overtime, uh, overhand, but a lot of times those were glancing blows. They weren't really uh, landing flush. So for Jessica, I was just kind of like those were the three weapons that she was using the most, and that was largely what she was doing. Even though she's a pretty good grappler herself uh, and, and can be solid from top, it seemed as though her goal wasn't to take this fight to the ground and get on top and try to win that way. It seemed as though her plan was just to win on the feet, and I guess the game plan on the feet was to use primarily three punches, and hopefully that'd be enough for her, And but in this case it wasn't. It was enough for her to win at least the first round and win two rounds on a couple of the judges' scorecards, but was not enough for her, th- for her to get the win for Calvillo. Um, occasionally she was trying to throw some big shots, um, l- largely overhand shots, to close the distance and see if she could do something on the feet to l- get some damage on Jessica I. Sometimes it was effective, other times not so much. But where she was effective and where she was able to win rounds was being able to take Jessica I down and get her down early on. She was able to get Jessica I turtled up and then get her back. Uh, from there, I did a good job of keeping her chin tucked and also going two-on-one on the choking arm to, to keep Calvillo from being able to sink, sink the arm under the neck and get the choke. So Calvillo wasn't able to, to get a finish, at least by submission. It was kind of weird. I couldn't really tell because of the camera angle in the second round what Jessica I had, whether she had both hands or just one hand. Because typically in a striking sport, especially MMA, if you're going two on one, that means that your two hands are occupying just one of your opponent's hands, which means that the opponent's other hand is free to do whatever, pretty much whatever they want with it. And so you would think if you're going two on one to defend one arm, that the other arm could be raining down punches. I'm not sure if she was able to clamp down on the second arm there, and that's why Calvillo was just kind of hanging there and waiting and trying to to work her way free or what was going on there exactly, but it seemed kind of odd that I was able to hold that position for so long without really having to pay for it. That's something you might see a little bit more maybe in jiu-jitsu where punches aren't there, and if you can tuck your chin, then maybe you can make it tough for them to get that other arm under your under your neck, but for whatever reason, Calvia wasn't really able to advance position there when it looked like she had plenty of time to work for a finish and wasn't able to do so. Uh, in the later rounds, Calvia would get the takedowns again, but for the most part there, she was ending up on top of a knee shield half guard from Jessica I. I wasn't doing a whole lot with that knee shield half guard to either push her away and get back up or to even attack or look for sweeps. Uh, but with that being said, Calvillo wasn't doing a whole lot to try to pass either by weaving or, um, I mean, I mean, there's a handful of different passes you can use. And also with MMA, you can use the strikes to distract and then try to use that to, to pass as well. But it seems as though Calvillo had a hard time passing that knee shield half guard um, while Jessica I was having a hard time really doing anything offensive with it. So in the end goes a decision. Cynthia Calvillo gets the win. Um, so I guess it was actually 49-46 on two judges' scorecards and 48-47 on another one. So one judge gave Jessica I two rounds. The others gave Calvillo four out of five. In the coming event, we had Marvin Vittori versus Carl Roberson. It was fairly obvious early on that Roberson was looking to land the left hand and let that be what, finished, what gets the finish for him. He was trying to slip off of Vittori's jab and try to throw the left hand over the top. Vittori was pretty well aware of it and was able to avoid that for the most part. Eventually was able to get the fight to the ground. Very dominant from top position. There were a couple times where Roberson did get on top of Vittori, was able to sweep him pretty quickly. Um, but from there, was throwing a lot of ground and pound from half guard. Uh, went for that one guillotine choke that was very interestingly defended by Roberson, where he was able to kind of like jump off the fence, kick into him, uh, roll through, ended up on top briefly, but then Vittori was able to get back on top. 
it was sort of weird at the end where Vittori had Roberson up against the fence in top of half guard, and and uh, Roberson had like a half butterfly. And typically from there, you want to be able to control the posture. Usually you want to pull the posture down and then use that butterfly hook to elevate either for a sweep or at least to create a scramble where you can get back up. For whatever reason, Roberson just kind of kept that half butterfly hook there and did nothing with it. Wasn't trying to control Vittori's posture. So Vittori was just teeing off on him from there. Uh, a couple times where it looked like he was like switching to sort of like that Z-guard slash knee shield. But again, that, that can be effective. But the point of having that foot there is to extend away and push him away to, to defend from the punches. And he wasn't doing that. He was just kind of hanging there. So... It, it didn't take long for Vittori to to keep advancing position from there. I was kind of surprised that the ref didn't step in earlier because there were a lot of unanswered shots and it wasn't really intelligent defense from Roberson. Uh, I, I guess Vittori was kind of like, why why aren't they stepping in here? So he kind of got to the point where it's like, well, this should be enough for TKO. They're not giving it to me. So I guess at this point I'll just have to get the, get the submission and finish him off. So he's able to get the back, sunk in the choke right away, and got the tap. So good win for Marvin Vittori. But before that, we had Charles Rosa versus Kevin Aguilar. Uh, fight mostly took place on the feet. Rosa seemed to be getting the better of the boxing exchanges. Was also doing a better job of landing to the body. And I think those body shots were really what did it for him. Um, so he ends up getting the win here by split decision, 29-28 uh, on all three judges' scorecards. Although one of them obviously went to went to his opponent. We had another split decision between Charles Jordan and Andre Feely. Jordan definitely won the first round by knocking Feely down, but Feely was definitely winning the second and third rounds. Uh, was also effective in getting takedowns and doing some damage on the ground as well. So it was kind of surprising that it went to a split. Even Jordan was surprised that a judge gave it to him. But in the end, Andre Feely gets the win. Uh, a couple of flyweights fighting up at Bantamweight with Jordan Espinosa and Mark De La Rosa. Uh, De La Rosa, he knew that for him to win this fight, he was going to have to bring the fight to the ground and use his jiu-jitsu to win. Um, but ultimately, his wrestling wasn't enough to get there. And even in some cases, when he was fighting off of his back. Espinosa is not a not a chump. He knows what he's doing, so he was able to stay out of trouble and land a lot of good ground and pound as well. So for as long as he was on the feet, Espinosa used his range and was able to land some heavy shots on De La Rosa. Um, when it went to the ground, usually it's because Espinosa was on top um, and he started that exchange. Um, but again, he'd do good to stay out of trouble on the ground, uh, land some nice shots. There was a moment where he was looking for a Darce choke, uh, well defended by De La Rosa, but again, De La Rosa was mostly defensive off of his back. He wasn't really all that offensive. And so Espinosa got the win. And then we had a fight between Maria Agapova versus Hannah Cyphers. Uh, not a very technically pretty fight, but Agapova was just kind of throwing wild in there. Cyphers got overwhelmed, uh, got hurt early, uh, was kind of in this position where he just, she was just trying to hang on for dear life just to stop the barrage and was just hanging on in a way that made no sense within a grappling context, but obviously she was hurt. Um, so while she was just kind of hanging on to one of Agapova's arms, Agapova just kind of like slid around, took her back, uh, sunk in the choke standing, uh, was able to pull her down on the mat, and then got the finish there. In the prelims, we had Marab Daviashvili, supposed to fight Ray Borg. Ray Borg had to attend to his son, uh, so he had to pull out. Gustavo Lopez, who was looking decent uh, for Combate Americas, uh, steps in on a couple of days' notice and just gets badly out-wrestled here. I guess to his credit, he got taken down 13 times and was able to get up a bunch of times. Obviously, you only have three rounds, so if someone has more than three takedowns, that means that at some point the guy got up, so... <laughs> I guess if we're going to give Gustavo Lopez some credit, he was able to get up multiple times from Marab, but every time he get back up, Marab would be able to put him back down. So in doing so, Marab was able to get a dominant decision win here, 30-25 on one judge's scorecards, 30-26 and 30-26 on the others. Uh, we had Julia Avila versus Gina Mazzani. Avila came out really strong, uh, was able to hurt Mazzani, get her up against the fence, just continued to throw from there. Ref stepped in in 22 seconds. Uh, so TKO for Avila. And then the quick knockout uh, with Tyson Nam versus Zaruk Adeshev. Um, Adeshev goes for a leg kick, I believe he was, I think it was Southpaw versus Orthodox, I don't remember what the exact um, stance was, but I know off of the leg kick, uh, Nam came in through a huge overhand right that landed flush, dropped Adeshev, and then while Adeshev was already hurt, uh, Nam landed one more hard shot to put him out for good, and that was the end of that fight. And then the first fight in the car was Christian Aguilera versus Anthony Ivey, and Aguilera uh, came in strong, was able to Heard Ivy had Ivy up against the fence and was landing a bunch of shots. Ivy wasn't defending himself, and the ref had to, st had to step in. So first three fights in the card all were finished by TKO in less than a minute, which was pretty nice. Uh, so that covers it for the Apex 2 card. Uh, for Apex 3, which is the Blades versus Volkov card, obviously in the main event we have Curtis Blades versus Alexander Volkov. I talked about this fight back when it was announced a couple weeks ago. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting one in that you would figure as long as this fight stays on the feet, Volkov should have the edge there. 
if it goes to the ground, obviously Blades should have the edge there. Volkov's no slouch off of his back, but Blades is very effective at staying heavy on top. He's hard to get off of you, and he's gotten very good at landing elbows from top and doing a lot of damage there. Uh, even if you look at the Overeem fight, he was able to land some really hard elbows from guard and use that to lead to a finish. So though Volkov will be okay with most people if Volkov's on his back, I don't think he wants to be on his back here against Blades. So it's going to be inter interesting to see how Volkov adjusts his striking to keep Blades from shooting in on him. One of the interesting things about Blades is that most heavyweight wrestlers are guys who are just going to try to drag you up against the fence and then drag you down. They don't really tend to shoot a whole lot. Obviously, even in college wrestling, you see a lot more shooting in the lower weights than you do at the upper weights. Because if you shoot on a really heavy guy and they defend the first takedown, it's a lot harder to chain through that, and you got a much heavier guy on top of you. Uh, but Curtis Blades is, has no issue shooting on guys at heavyweight, and he's very effective at getting the fight to the ground off of his shots. So it'll be interesting to see what type of striking we see out of Volkov, whether he's just trying to jab at range and he doesn't really throw a lot of kicks, uh, or whether he's just like, look, I, I need to win this fight on the feet. I'm going to use all my weapons here. If I get put on my back, you know what? That's the risk I have to take to win this fight. So tactics are going to be interesting here, but it's definitely one of those fights that are fun to watch where you know, depending on where the fight goes, that one fighter should have a clear advantage over the other. And if this fight goes to the ground, it should be a clear advantage to Blades. If it stays on the feet, it should be a clear advantage to Volkov, assuming he doesn't dumb down his striking too much to keep the fight from going to the ground. Coming event, another great fight, Josh Emmett versus Shane Burgos. Uh, this fight probably should have been the main event um, at UFC Apex 2, but I guess maybe they weren't able to get it ready that soon. Um, but it's definitely a better fight than I versus Calvillo, but that's neither here nor there. Um, Burgos, very good all-around striker. The only loss he has on his record is to Calvin Cater, who's just a better boxer than him, and he just he was able to outbox him. Uh, but generally, Burgos is the guy who's outboxing his opponents. He'll be fighting Josh Emmett, who is very powerful. He has decent boxing, but the power is really... Um, what's gotten in this far. Also has very good wrestling, though, so it'll be interesting to see if he tries to take Burgos down and m make this more of a grappling match. Burgos isn't an easy guy to, to wrestle fuck, so to speak, but it'll be interesting to see if Edmund can do that to him. I think that's going to be part of his game plan, or at least uh, enough, of, enough of a part of his game plan to the point where he wants Burgos to have to react to takedown attempts and maybe dumb down his striking. Uh, so that'll be a fun fight to watch, and I think the winner of it should definitely be ranked by the end of it if they aren't already. Uh, we've got Raquel Pennington versus Marion Renault. Uh, should be a decent fight. Raquel likes to drag fights to the mat and use her wrestling. Marion's a black belt. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that fight works or how that fight ends up going. Uh, we've got Bilal Muhammad versus Lyman Good. This fight was supposed to happen on April 18th, which was UFC 249. Lyman Good tested positive for the coronavirus and had to sort of step back and get that all cleared up. Uh, but we're finally going to get that fight. That should be pretty fun. Uh, Lyman, you would figure Bilal's going to want to take this fight to the ground and try to finish him there. Lyman's obviously a pretty good grappler himself um very strong as well uh so it'll be interesting to see how that works out and then we have jim miller versus roosevelt roberts as the last fight on the main card again really interesting fight where roberts has a very good guillotine he he's a pretty solid all-around grappler but jim miller should be much better on the mat on the feet roberts very long and very quick so it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how jim miller who tends to throw more looping punches is going to be able to deal with that um, so again, this could be one of those fights where, depending on where the fight goes, one guy has an advantage over the other. I think all around, Jim Miller is a better technical striker than Roosevelt Roberts. Roberts is very good at what he does, and oftentimes in martial arts, and really in any individual sport, if you're exceptional at a certain skill, um, sometimes you can beat guys who are better than you just because you're able to beat them in that certain area. So we'll see if Roberts is able to do that. On the prelims, we have Bobby Green versus Clay Guida, a fight that would have been very interesting five years ago. It's not, th not that it's not worth watching now, but... It's not nearly as important in the division, but still a fun fight. Uh, Tisha Torres versus Brianna Van Buren. We've got Mark andre Berrio versus Oscar Pijota, who I'm surprised is still in the UFC. He had that loss to Adolfo Vieira. Then he had a loss that was really bad to Puna Soriano. Um, and I thought he might have been gone after that, but it looks like they're still keeping him around for now. Uh, but he'll fight Berrio. If he loses this fight, he'll probably be gone for good. Uh, we've got Courtney Casey versus Jillian Robertson. Robertson was looking pretty good in the division. Um, prior to losing to Macy Barber, uh, you figure she's probably going to try to take down Courtney Casey. Casey recently is coming off of an armbar win, fighting off of her back. Um, so we'll see if she's able to throw out an armbars on Robertson or if Robertson's going to be able to get past that guard um, and win by ground and pound and possibly find a submission as she has with her past few oppo opponents before that loss to um, Macy Barber. We have Matt Frivola versus Frank Camacho. That should be a really fun fight on the feet. Frivola is a very good striker. Camacho, very fun striker to watch as well. Roxanne Mataferi versus Lauren Murphy. Kind of crazy. I just mentioned Macy Barber and how she was getting pushed towards the title uh, up until Roxanne Mataferi, who I believe is ranked sixth in the division, beat her. So you kind of figure that Mataferi would be pretty close to a title fight, but here she is fighting 
um, the, the second fight on the card here. Uh, she'll be fighting Lauren Murphy. Murphy is coming off of a win over Andrea Lee. So this is a fight that could mean a lot in the flyweight division. I'm not sure what their plans are right now. I think they just kind of want to have fresh faces for Valentina Shevchenko to fight. Cynthia Cavio could be one of those fresh faces. Uh, more realistically, the winner of this Montefiore versus Murphy fight is probably more deserving. Yes, just guy wasn't a one contender, and Cavio was able to beat her, but Montefiore and Murphy have done a lot more in the division. And for Montefiore, if she has wins over Murphy and has a win over Anthony Shevchenko, also has a win over uh, Macy Barber, that should be a stronger case than just a deci- just a decision win over just guy. So we'll see how this fight works out, but there's a chance that the winner of this fight could potentially find themselves in the title picture sometime soon. Uh, and then the first fight on the card is Joe Selecki versus Austin Hubbard. So next topic to talk about is going to be UFC Fight Island. They announced that on July 11th they're going to have UFC 251, so weekend after July 4th weekend. This is going to be a fantastic card, so here's the main card. Uh, I'll, I'll just read out the main card for this one. So main event is going to be the first of three championship fights. The main event's going to be at the heaviest weight class, as is often the case with how they order these, unless there's like a super pay-per-view star that's at a lower weight class, which isn't the case on this card. Um, but they have Kamaru Usman versus Gilbert Burns. This is one of those fights where it's like, normally I like to think about like how these different guys match up and then just kind of like make some guesses off of that. The crazy thing about this fight is that these guys have trained together so much that the people who have been in that camp probably know the answer as to who should win this fight. And so I'm going to have to look at the betting odds because I think a lot of times... At least if you have a smart bookie, they're probably going to reach out to some people and be like, hey, on the low, I don't need, I'm not going to like say who you are. I just want to know what you've seen between these two. But I think the answers in terms of who should win this fight have already been figured out, and I think both of these guys know who it is. I'm just curious to see if any of the media who are going to be interviewing anyone from Hard Knocks are going to ask the question and get the answer. Now, obviously, if you, gen- if you ask one of their teammates hey, who gets the better of who? Kamaru gets the better of Gilbert, or Gilbert gets the better of Kamaru? You're not going to get an answer to that. But if you frame it a little bit differently and say, is there a clear standout between the two of them? Or, like, are, are you confident that you know who's going to win this fight? Enough to... If you frame it in a way where it's like, is this one of those things where these guys go back and forth, or is this one where you kind of know um, one's better than the other? Getting an answer to that, I think, can sort of lead you down a road. And honestly, if the answer is, like, look, honestly... These guys, depending on the day or depending on what what they're drilling, um, different guys get the advantage. I mean, that can be interesting too as well. So I think before I start making picks on this fight or before I start analyzing this fight, I kind of have to do some more research and really listen intently on what their training partners are saying about this and what what questions are being asked to them, but then also what kind of answers we're getting from them. Because I think there's a lot of insight that's out there that could tell us a lot about how this fight's going to go. But... A lot of it you're not going to hear because you're never going to hear someone say, well, here's exactly what I've seen when they've sparred. Because um, you don't really want to make it make it out to be where if Gilbert's getting the, be- the better of Usman, that Usman has to hear that, or if it's the other way around, that Gilbert would have to hear it. But if you just generally say one of them is o- oftentimes winning the rounds, or, one of, or these rounds go about 50-50, that can still be very useful information. So I- I'd like to hear that. Uh, coming events going to be Volkanovski versus Holloway. So this was a fight that Volkanovski, I believe he broke his hand in, in the first fight, but he had won the first three rounds pretty clearly. Uh, latter two, Vol- Holloway was able to, to win, but still was enough for Volkanovski to take the title. What was interesting to me about this is that Holloway is one of these guys where over time he gets his reads on his opponents, and as he makes those reads, he improves over the course of a fight. And what's interesting about this being a rematch is that he he has five rounds with Volkanovski now, and has the reads from there. Now, obviously, Volkanovski is going to come in with some new stuff here. Holloway will come in with some new stuff with some new stuff as well. But if Holloway was able to win a couple of rounds in the first fight, and he has all the reads that he was able to make over the course of that fight, and he was improving over the course of that fight, in the second fight, at what point, like, like, is it going to start out and Holloway is going to be starting ahead and Holloway is going to win the first round and just kind of like run through him at that point? Is that what we're going to get? Um, is Volkanovski going to come out to a head start again? But if so, how long is that head start going to last? Is it going to last three rounds like last time? Is it going to last even longer than last time, which would be surprising? Uh, is it going to be shorter? Maybe he's only going to have two, get the first two rounds, and then Holloway's going to take over, and then win the next three. Like, To me, that's kind of what's really interesting about this fight, is that we did see Holloway over time, and it, it's tough to say, because again, like I've said before, like with Holloway, in, in general, with most of the guys he fights, he improves as the fight goes on. That was the case with McGregor. It was the case, it's been the case with Aldo. It's been the case with a lot of the guys he fights. 
So having that also be the case in the Volkanovski fight, it's fair to assume that that's because he was making his reads. But that being said, Volkanovski also broke his hand, and that was making it tougher for him. So it's one of those things where without this other context around Holloway, you could possibly doubt and maybe even say, no, don't don't assume that Holloway made all of his reads on Volkanovski. It's just because Volkanovski was injured. But because of the history that we have with Holloway, I still have to give credit to that and credit to the fact that he was winning the later rounds. And so for this fight, it's really going to be interesting to me to see what kind of changes Volkanovski does make in his game plan from this fight uh, to the last one, or to the next one, or from the last fight to this one, I should say. Uh, it would be interesting to see how quick Max Holloway is able to make his adjustments, and if he does make those adjustments again like he has in pretty much every every other fight, how quick how quick is he able to do it? Is he able to do it by early enough in the third round where he's able to win that third round and all of a sudden Volkanovski either has to do something new to win the fourth or fifth or Holloway's going to take it from there. Um, and if that's what we get, then there's a decent chance that Holloway's going to be able to get his title back. So that'll be fun to watch. Uh, the other title fight's going to be at 135. It's going to be Peter Yan versus Jose Aldo. I've talked a lot about this in one in the past. Um, it's interesting to hear that Peter Yan actually did train with Jose Aldo for a little bit. Uh, back when Peter was 5-1 and one and a, an up-and-coming prospect, and that was also while Aldo was arguably in his prime. And from what we're hearing, and again, the person who's saying this is Eduardo Dantas, who is a longtime teammate of Aldo. Peter Jan wasn't really ever a part of the team. It was more so that he just kind of came there to train for a couple of weeks. Uh, so I guess it's part of the reason why you're hearing about this, whereas with the Usman and Gilbert Burns situation, they were actually longtime training partners, and they actually were training at the same camp. It's not as though one of them was visiting a camp. They were both a part of the same camp. Um, but in this case, it sounds as though Aldo had gotten the better of him then. As far as what that means now, I, I mean, Peter Yan's improved a lot since then, and Jose Aldo's leg kicks have definitely fallen off a cliff, largely because I'm sure he's had plenty of injuries to him and he doesn't feel comfortable throwing those kicks. And so with Jan getting a lot better and with Aldo getting a lot worse, you'd figure that's going to make things a lot more interesting. You, I, I would figure, if I was just based off of what I've seen in the octagon recently, I would kind of lean towards Peter Yan. With that being said, if you do have a history with someone in the training room and they were just absolutely getting the better of you, how does that play into your mind? Like, Peter Jan's going to remember those training sessions that he had with Aldo. He's going to remember not doing well, if, if we're to believe that Dantas is telling the truth. And if that's the case, then you have to wonder, like, is he going to be able to just overlook and say, hey, that's a different fighter, that's a different me, like, don't even think about it. Um, that Aldo isn't the same one I'm going to fight, and he, what, what I was then is not the same either, so let's not even think about it. If that's the case, and he just kind of treats it for what it is, I think Peter Jan should be fine. But if he does have that going in the back of his mind where he's like, this is a guy who absolutely tooled me in the room, and I'm kind of worried that this is going to happen again, and he kind of lets that get to him, uh, that's going to make things tough. And I, I think that's one of the hardest things about picking fights is that when I do pick a fight, what I try to do is I try to think about each individual fighter at their best, um, each individual fighter's likely game plan, uh, and then try to figure out how it's going to actually work out based off of what they're capable of doing and what they should do. Um, but oftentimes when you have fighters who can get in their own head for different reasons, I think Cody Garbrandt's the perfect example of this. Where if you look at Cody Garbrandt's boxing, he I mean, he can be a problem for a lot of people. He can be a problem for TJ Dillashaw. He can definitely be a problem for Pedro Munoz. Um, but with that being said, he can get in his head sometimes, get a little bit emotional, not fight to the best of his abilities, and that's going to affect his fight. With Peter Jan, I don't know that I see him getting like super emotional in this fight, but if he's a little more tentative than he usually is because he's worried about what's happened in the past, that that could work against him. And if I'm just looking at what he's capable of doing versus what it, I think he's actually going to do, that, that's where it gets a little bit tricky, but I do think that Peter Jan should be able to get the win here. But again, um, it'll be interesting to see as this fight comes up. I'm sure some reporters are going to ask him, hey, here's what Eduardo Dante said. What, what's your take on it? And I think the answer he gives and the tone that he gives the answer and is going to tell a lot in terms of where his mindset is about those training sessions. So that's definitely something I look forward to hearing. Some other fights that have been announced are Dan Hooker versus Dustin Poirier. This fight was supposed to happen uh, in California before COVID hit. That fight card ended up getting canceled, no surprise. Uh, it was interesting to see whether or not Dustin Poirier was going to get reassigned to someone else, whether it be Tony Ferguson or another top contender, or if they were going to keep this fight together between him and Hooker. Um, Poirier's ranked number three, Hooker's ranked number five. They decided to keep it together, which is going to be good. So very exciting fight. Can't wait to see that. That's actually going to be the main event, not this coming week, but the week after that. Uh, so kind of crazy that's going to be happening so soon. Uh, we also have June Dos Santos versus Jarzinho Rosenstrike. So good to see that Jarzinho is okay after that brutal knockout to Francis Ngannou. So he'll be back. I believe this is going to be a main event as well. I'm not 100% sure. 
Uh, but he'll be fighting Junior Dos Santos, so he still gets to fight some of the top guys and some of the big names in the division after losing to Francis Ngannou. We also have Vulcan Ozdemir versus Yuri Prochatska. Uh Ozdemir has been a long-time contender at light heavyweight, fought Daniel Cormier, has been in there with some of the, tough guy, the toughest guys in the division, had that fight that he should have won against Dominic Reyes, but unfortunately the split decision did not go to him. Uh, so he'll be welcoming Prochatska, who's a champion in an outside organization of the UFC. Uh, so we'll get an idea of where Prochatska is at, but there's a lot of hype behind him. And then another one that was announced, I don't know if they have like a, a date necessarily or if they have a location set, but it looks as though it is signed for, for Daniel Cormier and Stephen Miocic. So this is a fight that we were expecting to have for a while, but it looks like this will be happening late August. And hopefully once it's over, Cormier will probably retire. I don't know what Stipe's plan will be after that, um, but then hopefully Francis and Gano will finally get his title shot and the heavyweight division can finally move on. Last thing to talk about is going to be fighter pay. So there's two parts to it. So I guess I'll go, th- go to Nate Diaz first because it's a little bit quicker, and then I'll go to Dominic Foxworth uh, second. So Diaz was giving hell to Gilbert Burns and also to Kamaru Usman for for what they are perceived to have taken to take the main event on Fight Island. Uh, pretty much saying that he makes more combined than the two, or more than the two of them combined in an individual fight. As far as that goes. Like I mentioned, and I feel like I have to keep mentioning it over and over, and I actually think that Chael Sonnen did a fantastic job this week. I would definitely recommend, if you haven't heard it yet, to listen to Chael Sonnen, whether it's on his podcast, uh, You're Welcome, or whether it's the show that he does. He, he did a podcast with Eric Helwani as well, which I thought was pretty funny, because Helwani has long been sort of like on that pro, pro pay the fighters more. Um, he, he's been on that side where he's like, yeah, the fighters are totally underpaid, and the UFC takes advantage of them, and that's sort of his argument, and that's part of the reason why him and Dana White don't get along so well. Um, whereas Chael is a little bit more more reasonable. He, he's a guy who is a promoter of a small organization up in Portland. Um, he was using sort of the backbone that he had of that um, in, in terms of the cage and the venues that he would have, and he would also run Submission Underground. Now, he's still been able to run Submission Underground, but I don't think his MMA show is still going right now, uh, at least not until they can have crowds again. Um, but either way, at least he, he understands from a promoter standpoint and also as an athlete who was able to negotiate for pay-per-view points even though he wasn't a champion, uh, he, he also understands that fighter pay is largely tied to what you're able to pull in and how much money you're able to make the company rather than necessarily how great of a fighter you are. And so it was interesting to hear a lot of what he had to say. A lot of this, this stuff he was saying is stuff that I've been saying for a while too. Now granted, I'm not saying that I that he's learning anything from me. If anything, you, you could argue it'd be the other way around. Um, it's not that I've like learned everything from, from Chael Sonnen. Obviously, I went to school for marketing. I've been working in business for quite a while. So I have my own way for, uh, of coming to the conclusions I've come to. But him and I have similar takes on it, I think, is the point that I was getting at anyway. Um, but he was pretty much saying, look, if you're not drawing in a lot of money, if you're not going to make the company a ton of money, then obviously you're not going to make a ton. Now, obviously, for Nate Diaz, with that Conor McGregor fight, that, that first fight brought in a ton of money. There was a ton of interest in that second fight. So obviously... He, he made a good check on the first one, uh, made a bigger check on the second one because they knew they were going to be able to make a lot of money in that. Uh, did a good job of selling the fight with Masvidal. They brought in a ton of pay-per-view money there as well. So, again, he was able to cash in there as well. And so as far as what Usman's going to make, Usman, as a champion, is going to have pay-per-view points. So if this fight card sells incredibly well and it's a, an interesting fight card, you got the debut of Fight Island, which I think a lot of people are interested in. Uh, you've got three title fights, so that could also bring a lot of interest. If it does sell well, then the factuality of Nate Diaz making more than these two combined probably won't be the case, assuming that they sell a lot of pay-per-views. If they don't sell a lot of pay-per-views, well, is it an issue if Nate Diaz makes a whole lot more? If Nate Diaz headline shows that make a whole lot more money for the UFC? No, it really isn't. So I, I, I don't know that Nate... I, I'm not sure exactly what Nate's point is. I, I don't know how Nate's contracts are designed, whether it's heavily based in guaranteed money um, with a little bit of pay-per-view points on top, whether... He goes more of like a hybrid where it's a decent amount guaranteed, but also a decent pay-per-view point, or whether he goes low guarantee but high pay-per-view. Um, but either way, he has been selling a lot of pay-per-views lately, and that's why the UFC was willing to pay them what they were, or why they were willing to pay him what they paid him. Um, for Gilbert Burns, not that he's a big draw at this point. Uh, I think a lot of people are still becoming familiar with him and learning more about him. And for Kamaru Usman, it, it's still interesting to me that the fight with Colby... It, from what I heard, it sold, it sold pretty well. It, it was on a card that I believe had three title fights on it. It had the Holly Volkanovski fight on it. And I believe it was the Holm versus Nunes fight as well. I think it was like the 400,000, 500,000. Obviously, those aren't official numbers. And 
those official numbers never get released. Um, but I guess apparently it doesn't sound like he made a, a ton of money, which means they probably didn't just blow it out with pay-per-views. But either way, um, that was an interesting fight for him because there was actually a, a grudge match. Uh, no real grudge match here, obviously, because he's friendly with Gilbert Burns. But it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. For Gilbert, I, I think in time he can become a, a bigger star because um, he does have a pretty good personality. And it, it's just one that it, it's just that he sort of like popped up on the scene so quickly and just like really hasn't had a lot of time to build his fights either. Uh, like the fight with Woodley, it's not like there was a, a giant build up to that. Um, the fight that he had with Damian Maya was a co-main event on a card with Charles Oliveira versus Kevin Lee, which I guess, thinking about that, I'm kind of surprised that Charles Oliveira, unless I'm wrong, I, I don't think he's booked yet with another guy, which is interesting. Um, but that's a tangent that doesn't pertain to what I'm talking about anyway. Um, but either way, it'll be interesting to see if either of these guys is able to, to build a bigger name for themselves and actually start to sell a lot more pay-per-views. But obviously, uh, the more you're able to sell, um, both in tickets uh, and pay-per-views, that's that's going to lead to you making a lot more money. So if Nate Diaz, a guy who is very successful at selling pay-per-views and at selling tickets, at least in his recent fights with Connor and with Jorge Masvidal, if he's saying, well, I make a lot more money than you guys, it's not that he's a bunch better negotiator. It's that he's offering more value that leads to him making more money. Uh, and then the other part was the first take segment with Dominic Foxworth and Dana White. So Foxworth was saying, hey, look, we've heard a lot of fighters coming up right now complaining about fighter pay. What do you have to say about this? And Dana was like, look, we've got like 600 people on our roster. This is like two people complaining right now. Uh, it's really not that big of a deal. We can't sell gates right now. We're losing a, mon- a lot of money that that could have been made otherwise on the gates. Um, so for these fighters to be coming in and, and demanding more money when we're not making more money uh, doesn't make a whole lot more sense. Uh, and then Foxworth was trying to claim, yeah, well, the fact... And I guess his response was to what Dana said. What Dana also said was that they're in a position right now where all the fighters and all the corporate staff are still being paid exactly what they were supposed to be making anyway. Um, and that unlike other sports where they're, they're arguing to cut fed or to cut pay for their athletes, like the MLB, uh, the UFC never did that. And Foxworth responded by saying, well, maybe that's because you were underpaying them so much that you were able to give them all that extra money. But that's not a fair assessment because if the UFC was just taking profits and not like hanging onto that money, if they're just like taking that profit and just like sharing it with all their shareholders or sharing it with Dana White, it's not like the money that's being spent to keep everyone employed or to keep all the fighters making the exact same money that they would have otherwise made, even though they're making no money on a gate. It's not as though that money was just coming from the pocket of someone who worked in the UFC. It's coming from the UFC's like actual corporate budget, which means that the UFC is keeping the money. They're not just distributing it to their leaders and making everyone at the top rich, which is what a lot of people like to pretend. So it actually means that they're doing a good job of managing their money. So you have to give them credit there, which is kind of surprising given that the parent company is heavily in debt, but still good on the UFC for being able to do that. So that wasn't a great point by Foxworth. And again, what was frustrating about that is that Foxworth was even like acknowledging like, look, I don't know a whole lot about this UFC situation. I just hear some complaints and I, I've been on the, on the player side in the NFL. Uh, so it, it seemed like he could have known a lot more before he started going after, after Dana White. And then for Dana White, it seemed like he didn't know a whole lot about the the union agreements in place for some of the other leagues because it felt like there was a really good opportunity for him to to really dig back at Foxworth and kind of explain some stuff to him. Uh, like I mentioned in the past, especially with the NFL, the NFL, if you sign a contract, you're, you're stuck under that contract. You can try to renegotiate. Sometimes they'll, the teams will do it. Sometimes they won't. But if you look at who won the MVP this year, it was a guy who was drafted 32nd overall and was playing on his rookie contract in Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson, if your assumption is that your worth is based off of how good you are, if Lamar Jackson is the MVP and therefore supposedly the best player in the league, he's not making what the best player in the league is supposed to be making. I think he's making like 4 or $5 million. Um, but a lot of other quarterbacks, even backup quarterbacks, are making like $10 million or more. Uh, but starting quarterbacks can make like up to $30 million. So even though he was MVP of the league, it's not as though his contract just shot up to $30 million because he was MVP. Uh, and this is, again, as a league with a player's union. So the idea that the unions are always going to operate in the best interest of the player, that's not necessarily true. Uh, for the guys in the top of the league, oftentimes they're going to be underpaid in a union. Uh, for the guys in the bottom, the union can be useful, but that's not really who we're talking about right now. If we're talking about Jorge Masvidal, if we're talking about John Jones, uh, if we're talking about Conor McGregor, these are guys who... The equivalents of a John Jones, a Conor McGregor, and a Jorge Masvidal in another league are probably getting underpaid because of the union uh, rather than being helped by a union. So that covers it for this week. Next week I'll be recapping the Blades versus Volkov fight card. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some more fights that are announced for those um, fight island cards. 
Uh, I forgot to mention that for Fight Island, they have four events that are going to be happening over the course of three weeks. So they have the 11th, I believe they have the 15th, the 18th, and the 25th of July. So those will all be events on Fight Island. Fight Island is in UAE. Um, so it, from what I've seen on maps, it's not like it's actually like an island off in the middle of the ocean. Uh, it's connected to some other land as well. But either way, it's going to be a pretty cool location. Hopefully, with it being in Abu Dhabi in the summer, they have a really good AC system. That's always been a problem for them, even in their last Abu Dhabi car card in September. Now, granted, if you're doing it in an arena with 16,000 people, uh, if you have, I, I mean, assuming each person is like at the average of 98 degrees, um, even if you have cooling in place, the, the crowd will make things warmer. If you don't have the crowd, maybe that'll make the cooling system a little bit more effective. So hopefully that's the case. We don't have fighters just gassing out immediately. Uh, and any ill effects of that, obviously, with the main event of Usman versus Burns, uh, if they're just dripping sweat because it's incredibly hot, that can massively affect their game plans, uh, especially for Gilbert Burns. If he's going to want to try to take Usman down and control him on the ground and be able to get a finish there, uh, the more slippery that you make Kamaru Usman, the tougher it's going to be for Gilbert Burns to do what he wants. So that'll be interesting to see, but I'm sure we'll, we'll learn more about it over the course of the week, and I'll be, be sure to talk about it uh, as that news comes up.